Welcome to the third lecture of the course Reinforcement Learning at Paderborn University. My name is Oliver Walchert and today we will walk through dynamic programming, the first method to solve MDP problems in a structured and iterative way. This allows us to avoid writing down a comprehensive Bellman equation system for a given MDP, as we had to do it last week, but to tackle the problem piece by piece and though in a much easier way. Therefore, the today's lecture is structured into these five parts. First, we are going to discuss the requirements and some basic intuition behind dynamic programming. Then we are going to use policy evaluation in order to estimate the value functions of a given policy, as well as policy improvement to find better policies compared to baseline. Both steps are then merged applying policy iteration with a special case called value iteration. Finally, we will briefly discuss some extensions and modifications to the standard dynamic programming framework. So what is dynamic programming or short DP? First, of course, we can distinguish its two terms, dynamic and programming. Dynamic is addressing any problem with has a sequential or temporal characteristic, and programming is meant in a sense of mathematical optimization so, for example, numerical solutions by numerical solvers. And dynamic programming in general is a large class of solution approaches, which can, for example, be applied to MDP problems, but also to many other neighboring problems, which are not directly characterized in an MDP. But in this course, we will completely focus on applying DP to MDP problems in particular, to finite MDP problems with a finite amount of state and actions. In the case, we are going to discuss continuous action state spaces. The DP solutions we will discuss today cannot uh, directly use, so we would have to apply quantization to that problem space and then work with the uh, dynamic programming solutions on that quantized problem space. However, as we also announced during the first two lectures, that we will use deep artificial neural networks or other types of function approximators in the second part of the lecture series in order to then address also continuous state and action spaces right away without the requirement of quantization. DP also will use value functions in order to structure, in order to order different policies in terms of their degree of optimality so which policy is better or worse compared to another can be directly seen at its value function and a very typical characteristic of dp is that it will break up an overall problem into different pieces will then solve these sub problems and then in the second step bring back together all the sub solutions in order to form an overall solution to a given MDP problem. And this also directly relates to the requirements we need to apply DP for any problem, so generally speaking. So DP can be applied to any problem with two characteristics. The one is that the problem needs an optimal substructure, so the principle of optimality, as we discussed last week of Bellman, uh, should be applicable and that for the different sub-problems, when we um, yeah, integrate these uh, solutions for the different sub-problems, that we can then derive an optimal solution also from the global point of view, which is that second point here, overlapping sub-problems. So the sub-problems, for example, recur many times so that we can reuse them and recache them in order to minimize or in order to reduce the computational amount. And the nice thing that exactly these two characteristics or problem characteristics of an optimal substructure with overlapping sub-problems is perfectly connected to MDPs. So the Bellman equation is providing us that recursive decomposition so we can structure the entire state space or state in action space by the Bellman equations into pieces, solve the different pieces and then put it together 
and this recaching or reusing idea can be then done by the value function. As you may remember, we will also see it again by that backup diagrams, backup idea that we can reuse and recache the value functions from successor state to current states and therefore have an overlapping sub problem structure. In order to provide you a little bit of intuition, we have prepared a little shortest path problem for you, which can be either solved using the exhaustive search or a dynamic programming approach. In our example here, the objective is to travel from city of Paderborn to city of Bieleveld in the shortest path fashion. And we have different options, either westbound route via Gütersloh, an eastbound road via Detmold or straight away via Schlossholte. And this is an animated uh, GIF picture, which I cannot directly uh, animate here within my PDF viewer, which I'm using for the presentation. So I have to switch over to Adobe Reader, Adobe Acrobat, which is able to provide you these type of animations. And here you can click on that animation button and now it runs. And for the yeah, exhaust the search algorithm, which is our, let's say, baseline algorithm here, we want to compare dynamic programming against. There we have uh, two characteristics. The first characteristic is that exhaust the search is probing the entire state and action space independently. So every travel route, every travel segment is completely evaluated independent from all other trials. And we are discarding any intermediate solutions. So these are the two main characteristics of exhaust the search. However, the nice thing is uh, exhaust the search as we are completely probing the entire state and action space. As I said, we will by sure get the optimal results because we have just tried out every possible combination of state and actions and therefore can be absolutely sure that one of our evaluations will give us the optimum result. In this case, in our simplified example here, that Exhaustus search algorithm found out that the way from Paderborn to Schlossholte to Bielefeld is the shortest one with a total of minus four, so minus three plus minus one. However, as you can see here by the different evaluations, which are marked in uh, red color, that all these travel segments are independently evaluated and intermediate results are discarded and therefore in total we need 14 individual tra travel segments evaluations in order to find that optimal path. And the nice thing behind dynamic programming evaluated at the same problem, so the problem setup is still the same, we want to travel from Paderborn to Bielefeld, is that we are now recaching our uh, intermediate solutions and therefore are able to reduce the total amount of travel segment evaluations. So what does dynamic programming do? In this case it is evaluating the travel route from our goal state Bielefeld in a backward view fashion. So we are evaluating okay what is the shortest way to Bielefeld for example from Schloss Holte and then the second question is, okay, how do we get fastest from Schlossholte to Paderborn? Okay, there's only one way, so that is easy. So what is the takeaway message here? That dynamic programming uses an intermediate solution. So the intermediate solution would be here, okay, shortest path from Bielefeld to an intermediate location, in this case Schlossholte. We know that solution, that is also the direct route here. And then we combine that intermediate solution with another intermediate solution, in particular that the way from Paderborn to Schlossholte is also the shortest directly taken here. So we can bring together the two pieces and also find then the optimal solution here right away. Compared to exhaust the search, since we are recaching, reusing these intermediate solutions, we can reduce on the number of uh, individual independent travel segments evaluations from 14 in the exhaustive search to 10 for dynamic programming and therefore we have reduced our computational demand quite a bit. And we will use this idea of evaluating our problem in an, for example, on the one hand in a backward fashion and also in that 
subproblem fashion so that we restructure our problems into different pieces in the following sections of our today le uh, lecture and we'll evaluate on different dynamic programming solutions which are not only applicable for shortest path problems as here in our example but also to any other MDP problem in a finite state in action space. Before we dig deeper into the particular algorithms of dynamic programming, I would like to summarize the utility of dynamic programming in the reinforcement learning context. So in the first lecture, we saw that uh, reinforcement learning can have different flavors in order to solve MDP problems, and DP is called an iterative planning solution. So basically what we need is we need a model of our problem and we will use that model for prediction and control purpose. Prediction, what was that? So prediction we want to estimate on a value function, on for example the state value function v for a given policy and a given MDP structure. So we put in our state space, action space, transition probabilities, reward function and probably a discount factor and a given policy which is fixed and static and then using DP algorithms which we will focus on next will give us an estimate on that value function. Second possibility or opportunity of DP in reinforcement learning is control. So we throw in only the MDP problem structure and our output will be an estimated optimal value function either in the state value or in the state action value fashion, which then gives us the direct policy. So to sum that up, DP, and this is really important point, requires full knowledge of the MDP structure. We requiring and assuming that this MDP problem definition, which we are using to derive prediction and control solutions is perfectly fitting the real world and therefore for many engineering applications where we have some deviation between the, the model we are using and the real system behavior therefore DP feasibility is uh, somehow limited because in the real world engineering applications there will be this gap between model and system. However we will strongly focus on DP concepts also in other data-driven reinforcement learning algorithms later and therefore it's a very important fundamental uh, idea pool which we will then use also for other algorithms in the subsequent lectures and therefore it's very important to understand the basic solutions idea uh, of DP which require that full knowledge of the MDP but can be also transferred to situations where we interactively learn by uh, getting data from an environment without the necessity of having a full uh, MDP knowledge. And we will use the dynamic programming approach first in a policy evaluation, which is basically the prediction part. So we are trying to evaluate a given policy in order to predict our uh, value function V pi. And therefore I would like to start with a small recap of the Bellman equation for a given state from the state space and basically what we had was here that backup idea, that recursive idea that the state value of a given state under a given policy is equal to the expectation of the future instantaneous reward during the transition to the next state uh, for a given policy plus the discounted value of that next state. So that was basically the Bellman equation. And this is for one particular state transition. And we can also extend that Bellman equation to the entire state space in matrix form by writing our state values in this state value vector over the entire action, uh, over the entire state space and also do that for the reward vector. Here we then have the transition probability from one state to another multiplied again by the unknown state value vector. So in the previous lecture on MDPs in general, we have 
use that linear equation system in order to directly solve for n unknowns. However, for small problems, of course, directly solving for that state value vector may be feasible. But if we have very large systems with a lot of thousands or even millions of, of states, then solving that equation by direct matrix inversion could be numerically very costly and not feasible at all. So therefore the idea of policy evaluation is to an, apply an iterative approximation with a decreasing error. So what we plug in is v hat i and i that index stands now for an iterative update of that value function here. So we start with some guess for example v hat 0 which would be our initial guess of the value function which could be either expert driven so if you have some prior knowledge about the system then we could plug in that or in most cases our initial guess on the value for a given state could be just zero and then over time we want to find updates on vi in such a way that this error for example in an h infinity fashion is reduced to zero with the amount of updates to find this Iterative approximation rule here, we can first rewrite our Bellman matrix equation by um, yeah, finding again this classical linear equation system. So normally we have Ax equals B. So because X is already our state here, I've used theta in order to denote that unknown vector here. So A and B are of, con of course known and theta in, in this case our state value vector is unknown. So A is then just identity matrix minus discounted state probability transition matrix and the B matrix is then our reward vector. And we could solve this linear equation in an iterative fashion with a multitude of different approaches such as a general gradient descent method, subspace methods or we can use the so-called Richardson iteration which is the state of the art or let's say the most used solution in the reinforcement learning and MDP context. So we will focus on Richardson iteration to solve equation 3.2 in an iterative fashion. However, just mention this is only one possibility among many others. Summarize again our problem. We want to solve a linear equation in the unknown vector xeta. And the Richardson iteration is basically that update rule depicted in equation 3.3. So what we update is our previous xeta i, so previous solution candidate, by a new solution candidate xeta i plus 1. And we take the old one plus an update, which is omega times b minus a times xeta i. And b and i are of course also known, they are coming from our MDP structure. And omega is a scalar tuning factor in order to ensure convergence and numerical stability of that update rule. Which we will inspect next in order to see what boundary conditions should be applied on the MDP structure and on omega in order to ensure that this series of approximations is converging to the final and true state value vector xeta. To inspect on omega and the general convergence of the Richardson iteration, we are introducing that approximation error E here, which is the error yeah, between our current approximation of the state value vector and the final value. If we plug that in, uh, in our Richardson iteration update rule, we get that the new approximation error at update E plus 1 can be summarized as the identity matrix minus omega times I A matrix times the last previous approximation error. And we can evaluate on the evolution of that approximation error by an matrix norm, for example, the H infinity matrix norm. So we are evaluating how that approximation error is evolving over long term. The nice thing with the H infinity norm is that it's an induced matrix norm and therefore it's submultiplicative and we can apply 
the inequality depicted in 3.6. So basically we split that right hand side here uh, in these two branches, EI, so the previous approximation error in H infinity uh, norm times that identity matrix minus omega times A also in H infinity norm as then always greater or equal the next approximation error. So basically what is the takeaway message here? If this component here is smaller than one, then we can guarantee that the next approximation error at step E plus one is always smaller than the previous one and therefore that series will converge to its true value. So basically stated here again, so if that expression here is smaller than one, then the series converges. So we can plug in then A, our matrix A is of course known, it's depending on our MDP structure, mainly on the state, prob state transition probability matrix and the discount factor. And we get this expression here, which has to be smaller than one in order to ensure convergence. One, let's say very simple, approach which could be done here is just to put omega to 1 because in this case if we put omega to 1 we get that this parenthesis is equal 0 and the entire expression simplifies a lot. Of course omega is 1, gamma is a constant scalar factor can be put in front of that H infinity matrix here and the nice thing is since the um, H infinity uh, matrix norm on the state transition probability will give us that uh, the yeah just the the sum of the row elements per row of of that matrix, but as this is a state transition probability matrix, we know that the sum has to be always one, because otherwise the state transition probabilities in the state space wouldn't be well defined. So basically, this in a well defined MDP is one. So perfect. We can then summarize that for omega equals one that in an MDP case where we use discounting, so where our gamma is always smaller than one, then the Richardson iteration will always converge. For non-discounted MDPs, we may have to change omega to higher values, for example, where we won't discuss this case in detail. Normally, if you use any a linear equation solver, which is able to provide also iterative updates like denoted here with the Richardson iteration, that solver will evaluate on this um, yeah, convergence proper, uh, property here and automatically tune omega in such a way that numerical stability and therefore convergence is always guaranteed. However, nice case that if we again use discounting, we also discussed that the last time discounting can be numerical very useful for a lot of MDP problems and here again for the Richardson iteration in order to iteratively evaluate the state value vector again that discounting can be very useful. So we can then basically plug in the Richardson iteration into the Bellman equation to get an iterative policy evaluation. So basically what we see here is the Bellman equation now in an iterative fashion. So we get an, again an additional index with i plus 1 on the left hand side, so our Richardson update. At the next update step is basically the Bellman equation based on the successor state, but with the previous Richardson update. So just the Bellman equation as we have used it before, but now in an iterative fashion. We can also extend that or just transfer it to the entire state space and therefore in matrix form. Same thing applies here. We get our new Richardson state space update or state value update based on the old one. And so therefore equation 3.12 can be easily used for an iterative update. So this is basically the solution if we know our reward vector and if we know our state transition probability vector we can just start with any arbitrary guess for our state space for our state value here and then iterate a couple of times until we see that this relation here is converging 
and that per update step, it, yeah, there is not much movement between the update at time point, not time point, but sample point i and i plus one. And then we can abort our evaluation. Therefore, if you're applying Richardson iteration to policy evaluation, the backup diagram is pretty much the same as we have discussed it for the MDP case with the Bellman equation. And again, the only real difference is that we're now operating on an iterative fashion. So to sum that up, the Richardson iteration is basically giving us an estimate on the state value of a given state replaced by a new value of its successor state. So therefore it's updating vi plus one for a certain state based on the previous update of the successor state xk plus one. And therefore we again operating with the so-called bootstrapping because an estimate is corrected or is updated on the basis of another estimate. So this is called bootstrapping. We are estimating based on estimates. An interpretation of the Richardson iteration can be also found as a gradient descent algorithm for solving that linear equation. So 3.2 was the linear equation in the unknown state value vector. And basically that would be just the same as Richardson iteration doing gradient descent. And that is then also considered a synchronous full backup of the entire state space. So one evaluation of the entire Richardson iteration would be a full backup. So full backup means we evaluating all states in the state space. So non-state is left behind, everyone is updated and that in a synchronous fashion because, the syn because a matrix form all states and therefore all state values would be updated at the same time. So these are the two important characteristics of the Richardson iteration for policy evaluation. Full backup means the entire state space, all states, in parallel means synchronous. And this is also based on an expected update because we use the expectation uh, of all possible successor state utilizing our full MDP knowledge. And however, in subsequent lectures, of course, we will also, not today, but then in the subsequent lectures, we will also supplement this idea of expected updates by data-driven samples of the environment. But today, as I said, we will utilize our full, knowledge, full model knowledge in the dynamic programming case. So let's Apply that iterative policy evaluation by Richardson iteration on our well-known forestry MDP, which we will again evaluate on the basis of a 50-50 policy. So in every state, there is a 50% probability that we will cut a tree and 50% probability that we will wait until the, state, until the tree is hopefully grown. However, in every state, there's also a 50% chance disaster probability that the tree will be gone if we wait. Therefore we can then for this 50-50 policy we can again so that is the results or the yeah, not results but the evaluation we already did last week for a full MDP evaluation so that is in the state proper transition probability following that 50-50 strategy and here is then the reward vector following that 50-50 policy. And we, what we can do now is just to use that MDP knowledge and evaluate based on the Richardson evaluation. So we could do that by just starting with some arbitrary guess and our arbitrary guess for the update at zero iteration would be just putting all state values to zero, which is just an arbitrary simple guess. And then we apply the first Richardson iteration uh, and if you remember that was just applying the Bellman equation because the uh, all the successor states guesses are still zero. What is basically happening here is just we are just updating based on the reward vector. So basically the reward vector will be then our second guess here or our guess at iteration one. And then we can continue evaluating on that Richardson iteration based Bellman equation. And after a couple of uh, updates, we can then see that by Richardson evaluation, the 
iterative state value updates are getting closer and closer and closer to the final values as we have also calculated them last week. However, you may see here that infinity, we don't of course have to evaluate on the Richardson evaluation for an infinite amount of steps. Of course, we can just evaluate the difference between two steps. And if we see that the difference between two steps is such small that we are below a certain approximation threshold, of course, we can cut uh, on all subsequent evaluations and yeah, cancel or exit our evaluation here. Next, I would like to introduce a little variant and little add-on to the standard Richardson iteration where we used full synchronous backups. So that meant that we updated the state value vector in one big shot. However, we have also the degree of freedom in order to update the state value vector, so the, the different state values inside that vector in a particular useful beneficial order, which we will then cause in-place updates. So what is the in-place update? Basically the same as we did before, policy evaluation by Richardson iteration, but we don't update the entire state space in one shot, but state per state. And this is summarized here in that algorithm 3.1. Let's go through it briefly. So input, of course, we have a prediction task here. We have to give in the full model plus the policy, which has to be evaluated. We introduce a in threshold parameter, small delta, which is then terminating that algorithm as soon as our updates are smaller than this threshold parameter value. And of course, we need an initialization for the entire state values in the state space, including the boundary conditions that terminal states are always initialized as zero. However, a common a general initialization is to put all other initializations also to zero in a an, in an general fashion. And then this in-place update um, is basically structured into two loops. That first repeat until loop is basically our repetition over different Richardson iteration cycles, so could be denoted by that index i. And then in every iteration we are going through the entire state space and we will update one state value of that state space with the usual, so this is again here the usual Bellman equation update, however we will do that step by step for every state and then evaluate on the, yeah, let's say, degree of um, significance of that update, how much the different state values changed, and if that change was relatively minor, so smaller than our threshold parameter, then we will terminate the in-place updates. So let's summarize that and also make it a little bit more intuitive by an example. So in-place algorithms are basically the standard um, policy evaluation updates, but in a beneficial step-to-step -step order of the different states and as we will see also in our next example that this may be faster than the regular Richardson iteration because we are sweeping through the entire state space in a more uh, wisely order. So for the first three MDP which is again our standard example here we will uh, use the in-place updates for policy evaluation starting in our termination state, so in our gone state, x equals 4, and from that reverse the order. So we will update state number 3 from 4, 2 from 3, and so on. And if we do so, uh, we can see here the, uh, again, in-place updates for the first uh, 3 MDP, again with the zero uh, initialization for all values in the theorist iteration. At one, at then we are updating from back to back. So here, of course, for the gone state, nothing really changes. However, now here this two for state number three was also the same for the regular Richardson iteration. However, in the in-place updates, we are not updating this entire uh, ETH update in a synchronous 
away but in place. So that means that this update for state number two is not already improved because it can profit from the previous in place update of the state number three. And again, state number one is profiting from a previous in place update of that state number two. So in this fashion, we can see that, so if we compare that table, especially the first three updates with uh, the previous slide of the non-in-place updates, so regular Richardson iteration, that this is converging much quicker, especially here for the state number one and state number two, but this converges much faster. And you will also use the in-place updates in one of our exercise class, which we have prepared for you in order to evaluate that this degree of freedom which we can use here by in-place updates can be beneficial for many similar MDP problems. So now as we have found a tool in order to iteratively evaluate policies to find their state values, we are now using another dynamic programming tool for policy improvement. So our question is, okay, if we know already the state value of a given MDP, how can we improve that policy? And the idea is pretty much summarized as here. So the idea is that we are considering new non-policy conform actions. So we're just looking for actions U which are not in line with our current policy. And then our idea is we evaluate that certain one action for the next step and assume that after we have applied that action, we are thereafter staying to the current policy. So it's like a, yeah, just a little side move and then going back to normal policy for all other successor states. And the idea is that we evaluate this new move by the action value as our performance measure. So the action value can then be compared against different actions in that sense of non-policy conform actions. And then we can evaluate if any state action to any new action which was not in line with our current policy is better or worse compared to our current policy. And then based on that comparison, we can decide if we want to make new move part of our policy. So if we want to change our policy or if we stick to our current policy. And we can summarize that idea in the so-called polythe improvement theorem, which is depicted here on the slide. So the polythe theorem basically it is first stated in a deterministic fashion. However, we will also give a note on stochastic policies later on. But first, in the deterministic case, if we compare any policy pair pi and pi prime in terms of that action value at a certain state, if we plug in that new move denoted by pi prime for that state, and if we find out that this action value is greater or equal than the previous state value for the given policy pi, then we can denote that policy p prime must be as good or better than our baseline policy pi. So in this case, we can state then that policy p prime is better in the state value or equal for the entire state space. And this was exactly our definition of optimal policies based on the uh, Bellman notation for MDPs. The proof of that policy theorem is rather straightforward, although here are quite a few intermediate steps. However, what we do is just we plug in the policy improvement equation from the previous slide into our Bellman equation and recursively apply that right away. And if we do so, step by step you may have a view on this derivation by yourself in your own pace however what is the takeaway message here is that if we do so if we plug it in and use the Bellman equation that we can state that our 
old state value given policy pi will be worse or in the best case equal to our new policy p prime and therefore we could prove that by policy theorem application we are able to find improved policies using that greedy action selection so greedy policy improvement is here also the right buzzword because basically what we have discussed in the last two slides is addressing only one single state and if we do that to the entire state space then we are extending our entire policy and we can call that a greedy policy improvement and the greedy policy improvement basically summarized here in equation 3.17 is looking from our current state for every state for the entire state space what is my best possible next move so that is this arc max so we want to maximize the state at the state action value and we play back and extract then that best possible move to our new policy p prime and this is basically denoted here once in the expectation notation and a second time in the matrix formulation and yeah just as a side note here that reward vector or reward function could be deterministic and stochastic so basically what does that greedy policy improvement theorem is doing a one step look ahead search in every state and therefore perfectly satisfies this policy improvement theorem and in case that we will find out that after applying that greedy policy improvement so we did our arc max over the entire state space for every action and we would find out that in the yeah updated case so v p prime is equal v p then what would be the result the result would be that v p prime is equal to that expression here and if we compare this to this then it turns out this is basically the Bellman optimality equation and therefore can give us a guarantee that the found policy using greedy policy improvement is the optimal policy or part of the set of optimal policies there may be one optimal policy for a given MDP or a set of optimal policies which perform equally well yeah so that's basically also denoted here the amount optimality equation is given in 3.18 and therefore we can guarantee that p prime must be part of the set of optimal policies and although um, we have proved that for only deterministic policies on the one of the previous slides we transfer to stochastic policies so a distribution over actions giving states can be also shown but we don't give that proof here in detail so what is your takeaway message for the policy improvement approach in dynamic programming the takeaway message is that applying policy improvement by greedy actions will give us a guarantee to find the optimal policies in finite mdps and that policy improvement theorem or that guarantee in, in order to find the optimal policy is very very important because we will also reapply it to most of our subsequent reinforcement learning solution algorithms and therefore can benefit from that statement that these other solutions or these other approaches based on uh, sample data not here on a model but on sample data are also able to find that optimal policy so this is a very important takeaway message which applies for dynamic programming but we will re reuse that policy improvement theorem also for subsequent methods so that's why dynamic program is very important because it uh, gives us that basis that also other important uh, methods are converging to the optimal policy so now we have discussed let's say two different steps policy evaluation so prediction and policy improvement more or less independent from each other and now the question is how can we combine these two aspects of dynamic programming and we do that by 
policy iteration and the special case of that is so-called value iteration. But first start with policy iteration. Policy iteration is more or less straight up forward. We just combine the previous policy evaluation and policy improvement in an iterative sequence. So we start by some given policy, pi zero. So this is our initial policy, some, some random policy, for example. And for this given starting policy, we do a policy evaluation step. So that would be then giving us v pi zero by policy evaluation, for example, Richardson iteration or in place evaluation. For that value information, then we could do a greedy policy improvement and get p1. And then from that, again, doing policy evaluation, get vp1 and so on. So we iterate by evaluation and improving all over again until we found that after in greedy policy improvement, vpi and vpi successor are the same. And therefore, by the policy theorem or also by the Bellman optimality equation, we know, okay, we have found our optimal policy and therefore the best possible value. So here, the uh, little side note, a little lengthy here, but what is that side note? Is basically that in classical policy iteration, so this is the, the difference to value iteration, which we will discuss on the um, on the following slides. But in the classical policy iteration, the assumption is that we do a full evaluation on the policy by these evaluation steps here. So we run the Richardson iteration, for example, so many times in each evaluation step that it really converged uh, up to some numerical rest error. And we will discuss then with value iteration if that is really necessary or if we can abort these policy evaluations also after a small amount of policy evaluation steps. However, in classical policy iteration, these updates here, these policy evaluation updates would be full updates with complete convergence. So let's do that. Uh, policy iteration, which is just combining the policy evaluation and policy improvement we have discussed before, again, with our Fourier tree MDP, which is again summarized here. We have four states, the small tree, medium tree, and large tree, and the gone tree as a terminal state. In each non-terminal state, we can either cut or wait uh, for the tree to go. And now we want to apply policy iteration in order to find an optimal policy for this given MTP. And we will do that on two occasions or two starting points. The first starting point I have denoted as tree hater initial policies for this disaster probability and this discounting factor. And tree hater initial policy, of course, means we don't want to see any trees in our forest or we don't want to see any forest at all. So basically in every state we want to cut the trees. So that would be our initial policy. So from that first policy iteration step would be to do a policy evaluation. So we take policy evaluation, for example, by in-place updates, do the entire sweep until convergence and we will get our state values for this initial policy, which would be one for the initial state, two for the second state and so on. Then again, okay, evaluation step is followed by an improvement step. So we write down the greedy policy improvement and we will find out that with respect to our initial policy, P0, we have one change and this is here in the state number one in the small tree state we have found out by the argmax over our uh, Bellman equation here that the uh, better choice would be to wait and not to cut down. Whereas for the second state as well for the third state we will stay with cutting. So we have changed our policy based on the greedy policy improvement and then have to reevaluate. So we do that, okay, policy evaluation, and we find out, aha, uh -huh, okay, our state value has increased in state number one, but state number two and three are unchanged, and of course our terminal state here, number four, is also pretty much the same. Okay, then again, do greedy policy improvement, and again, argmax over the uh, Bellman equation here, and we find out, okay, now we cannot change our policy anymore. It doesn't make any sense. 
here these three actions in the three states are the same as with p1 compared to p2 so that means based on the policy improvement theorem or the Bellman optimality equation that we have found our best policy p prime and as you may remember for this alpha and for this gamma this policy which is depicted here is also exactly the optimal policy we have investigated on on the direct mdp solutions in lecture number two we can also apply this example with a certain different initial policy so for the hippie policy or tree lover policy we could start with waiting in every state so we really want to have a a very large forest and we don't want to cut any forests uh, anymore so that would be then our initial policy however we still want to improve our value based on this initial uh, policy and if we do so we start with policy evaluation of course and we find out that we will get the uh, yeah these values in the four different states and then we will do really policy improvement again on this evaluation and interestingly here even though we start with the tree lover initial policy so with a completely different policy in the zero st step that after that first greedy policy improvement we already found again our optimal policy so we only will wait in state one and do cutting in state two and three so again just to fulfill the policy iteration algorithm to its end we do policy evaluation for this new policy p1 really policy improvement based on that evaluation again finds out okay second step is equal to the first step so we found also here our best policy independently from the initial policy so this is really a nice takeaway message for finite mdps applied or applying policy iteration to finite mdps that we will always find the optimal policy independent from the initial policy and just have to fulfill that cycle out of policy evaluation and policy improvement. So here in that simplified example, we already converged after two really policy improvement steps, which is really, really quick, of course. However, this is highly linked to the fact that the state and action space of our forestry MDP is very small. In the lecture of Bato and Sutton, we will also find a little extended policy iteration example, which has uh, some more states and actions. The example is called the Jack's car rental. And uh, our idea is here, or our task is to operate a rental car rental company in an, in an optimal fashion. So we have basically uh, two rental locations which are exchanging cars with each other and two and the two rental locations have a maximum capacity of 20 cars per location. So there cannot be more than 20 cars per location. The actions uh, we can fulfill as the owner of that rental company is we can move up to five cars between the two locations uh, overnight. So we can move up to five from the one to the other and the reward uh, which is then um, has to be maximized in the long run is that we get a positive plus ten dollar reward if a car was rented at a certain location we will see the renting probability uh, shortly after so if there is a car available uh, we get that juicy plus ten dollar re reward if of course the customer is coming to rental location and there's no car left then uh, he or she will be able to rent it and therefore will not pay us and for transferring car overnight we will assume a little uh, fee a little expense for example for the driver and we are operating with a discount factor of 0.9 the dynamics of the mdp <coughs> so the let's say state transition probability are randomly modeled by Poisson distributions um, as given here in that equation and that Poisson distribution can be interpreted as a probability of observing n events with a mean event rate of lambda so basically how much is then 
requested and returned. So in our case, uh, we, or in, not in our case, but in the case of Barton and Sutton, the request case of uh, location one is three and the request rate of uh, the second location is four and the retrieving rate is three and two. And with this MDP background, so this slide is giving us more or less all information we need to set up the MDP model, which is required. So full model knowledge for applying any dynamic programming approach. And then we can use in particular policy iteration in order to find an optimal policy. So the optimal policy would be then of course, how many cars I have to shift from one location to the another, depending on this state information. So depending how much cars are in a certain branch of the rental company. So the evaluation of the best policy uh, is shown here. So in the initial policy, we start with zero. So there's no shift from one location to the other. Whereas here on the y-axis, this is the number of cars at the first location from zero to 20. And the x-axis of every of the subplots is the number of cars in the second location starting from zero to 20. And then by policy evaluation and improvement, we can see that the policy is changing over time. And in this case of uh, Jack's car rental, we will receive an optimal policy already after four policy iteration steps. And the result of the policy is denoted here. So basically we have a yeah, very broad class here in the middle, state combinations of first and second rental location where we don't want to shift any cars overnight. And then depending on the dynamics we have assumed or model for the MDP, we will see that of course in this case where a lot of cars are in the first location so plus five means we want to shift five cars from the first location to the second location and vice versa if there are a lot of cars in the second location and nearly no cars in the first location vice versa we want to shift some of them back to the first location so that would be the best policy and here on the right hand side we will find the according state value function for that policy, which has also, of course, a trivial statement that in any case, if we are somehow lucky, so in both locations, that would be here at this point in both locations, we have 20 cars, we have then the highest long-term state value, which would be around $612. After the examples of policy iteration, we now want to modify this solution mythology towards a more simplified solution, which is called value iteration. So in policy iteration, I have stressed out that in every policy iteration loop, the evaluation step will be uh, completely run through. And that may be, of course, very computational demanding, especially if we have a large state space, then uh, this evaluation maybe takes a lot of computational power. And the idea of a value iteration is to save the number of evaluation steps to a minimum. And in the extreme case, and this is exactly what value iteration is doing, is that we are doing the policy evaluation step only in one step. So we don't run the f uh, full cycle, but we only do a one step iterative policy evaluation followed by a policy improvement step. And this allows us to nicely integrate the two steps evaluation and improvement into one update rule, which is denoted here in equation 3.20. So value iteration allows us to combine a policy improvement with a truncated policy evaluation step. So basically here, what we find from a policy evaluation is of course here the uh, update in terms of the policy evaluation at step i plus one is depending on the uh, successor state value at the update uh, step e. And now with that fusion with that integration of policy improvement we're just not doing that update here for a given policy but we are 
changing our policy with every update by that max operator here, which is basically then our greedy policy improvement. So value iteration it is the integration of policy evaluation and improvement in a one step fashion. If we write down that algorithm and pseudocode, we will find that we need only a model because for value iteration, we are operating on the state values. So we don't need an, uh, initial, an initial policy to be evaluated and optimized, but it's already sufficient to just start with an initial value guess. And then, as we see here in the pseudocode, we will, in the last step, evaluate on our optimized value function, on our optimized state values found out by value iteration and can then, in a one-step look-ahead manner again, evaluate on our optimal policy. So that is also, let's say, could be an, an advantage for value iteration that we know that we don't have to provide an specific explicit policy here. So we just start with the full model again of the MDP. We need again an accuracy threshold. We need, as discussed, only an initialization of all state values. And then similar to policy evaluation, we do the sweeps over the um, yeah, different iterations and we yeah then in like a nested for loop we do the sweeps over the entire state space that could be again done in a in place fashion as denoted here and then the important difference to the in place policy evaluation update is that again here this max operator so we are putting together evaluation and improvement step into one update cycle then we go through that update cycle all over again until we find out that the threshold is met and then output the de deterministic policy if required by an one-step look-ahead search. So pretty nice that we can easily integrate these two steps into one. If we apply that for the first three MDP again with our typical values of alpha 0.2 and gamma 0.8, we can reapply that idea from a policy evaluation with in-place updates to start from the back, so from the gone state, and then apply this also here to value iteration. So we reverse the order and start iterating at the state x equals 4. And in value iteration for this small state space problem, we are pretty quick done in particular in one step. So we again start here at zero's guess. So our initial guess is that we just put arbitrary all state values to zero. And then, as I said, value iteration with in place updates. So again, we start from the last state and then move forward to the, let's say, earlier states, three, two, one. And by value iteration, we can find out, okay, our best choice we have in state 3 is cutting, therefore our state value is 3. Same in state number 2, medium size 3 here, also cutting is our best option, so that is equal than 2. And then by in-place value iteration, these two state values here are already set. And also for this initial state of uh, the small size 3, we can directly find our optimal value in that first iteration. And this is a really nice feature, of course, this very quick, so like one iteration convergence, of course, is not a general uh, property of value iteration. This is only due to the small state in action space, but uh, you will also find out during the exercise sheet on value iteration that the algorithm is rather quick. And yeah. Of course, if we want to evaluate, if we want to derive an explicit policy and value iteration, we would to do that one step look ahead search now based on these state value estimates or state value calculations in order to derive the explicit policy in the different states. So we didn't do that here for the example because it was already known for the in place updates with a policy improvement. However, just to mention that again, so value iteration in its core is not delivering explicit policy on its own. So with that, we are more or less having the, the core discussion on 
dynamic programming for reinforcement learning uh, behind us. So we have learned how to do prediction and control and to fuse these two ideas into one. And now we want to discuss some further aspects on dynamic programming. So first, uh, one remark on complexity of dynamic programming. Um, as we also saw with the value iteration, we have applied that to the state values only. And we can denote that for an MDP, which has n states and m actions, we have an overall dynamic programming complexity of m times n square. So evaluate all n square state transitions while considering up to m actions per state. So that is quite useful information. Why I'm showing that here is to compare it against the idea of applying dynamic programming to the action values q which could be of course also is possible so we can just use more or less the same equation slightly modified to the uh, action case action value case however then we have to live with an inferior complexity of m square times n square because we have to evaluate m square actions in up to n square state transitions so this is a drawback of dp applying to action values that we will have an increased complexity. So that's why typically the dp algorithms are operating on the state values and then do that one step lookahead search to explicitly derive a policy in a second step after the value iteration is drawn. If we then also summarize our three main algorithms we have discussed today, just as a small summary, we can evaluate or state that the policy evaluation algorithm was for prediction and it's based on the Bellman expectation equation, which we got to know last week. Then the policy iteration was basically a control algorithm which is based on the Bellman expectation equation together with the greedy policy of improvement and then derived from the policy iteration we have learned that value iteration is also controls pretty much the same background pretty much the same task however here we can only or we only have to work with the Bellman optimality equation so we don't use greedy policy improvements here in terms of deriving an explicit policy right away but do that in the last step and therefore the value iteration is a little bit more lightweight compared to policy iteration as discussed. Another important aspect is that as we have discussed DP is using or in, in that way we have discussed it so far is using synchronous updates so in every iteration we are sweeping through the entire state space. Of course we have used in place updates so we could change the order of how to go through the entire state space but in general we visited or updated every state every state value in each iteration however um, we don't have to because that might be especially very uh, computational expensive if we ha have large mdps and there might be states inside that uh, state space which are converging faster than others. So it might be sufficient to update some of them only occasionally and others in every occasion in order to um, yeah, speed up their convergence rate. And we call that an asynchronous update. So basically what we do is we are choosing a smart order again um, of updating our states, but some states may be just updated more frequently than others. So in each ETH iteration, we may only update 10%, 20%, 30% of the state space and try to make a good intelligent decisions on which states are updated when. However, an important requirement which has to be stated in asynchronous updates are that the overall algorithm conversion is only guaranteed if we are still visiting all states to some extent so if you're doing hundreds and thousands of asynchronous updates asynchronous backups and we are leaving out 
some parts of the state space entirely so we are not updating them at all then there is some likelihood that the algorithm will not converge probably and therefore it is required to ensure that even if we do asynchronous updates that over a couple of of uh, update uh, loops that all states are still visited and of course we can just simply do that for example by using the in place uh, policy evaluation update where only a subset of states are updated in each iteration and the same can be of course also applied to the value iteration algorithm and in the following i would like to present two typical asynchronous dp ideas the first is called the prioritized sweeping approach which is basically using the so-called Bellman error as an indicator which state should be updated next. So the Bellman error is basically this expression here inside the inner uh, magnitude operator and the Bellman error gives us a prediction on how much the state value will be changed if we update this particular state transition from xk to xk plus one and yeah the idea of prioritized sweeping so prioritized in that sense that we will have a look on the entire state space and try to find that spa that state which is likely having the largest state value changed when be updated next we can also build up an priority line for example to sort different state into those lines um, after each other such that we don't have to evaluate the entire state space with the Bellman error all over again when we did an update but to uh, occasionally yeah, update the priority lane and then uh, move forward on that priority lane and update states based on their uh, ordering there. So that would be one option in order to update the states and the second idea would be the so-called real-time updates which are basically denoted in this figure here so if i'm in some certain state at the moment i'm evaluating the state space around my agent uh, separated into the relevant states so which are reachable within a certain number of state transitions under the current policy and the relevant states which are so far away from my current state which I wanted to evaluate such that they are not really reachable for me in a certain amount of transition steps. And with that knowledge about the MDP plus a knowledge about the policy of the agent, so the behavior of the agent, I can then split the state space and trying to do the updates only for that part which are relevant at the moment for me and then over time of course the agent will move through the state space for example by exploring and then other parts of the state space will be updated later when they are more relevant for the agent at that current point of time. So with these two ideas prioritized sweeping and real-time updates I can try to update my state values in a more efficient way and this idea of updating the state values so doing policy evaluation followed by an improvement step um, is typically considered a general policy iteration framework or as part of the generalized policy iteration framework which i would call somehow a push-pull framework so on the one step we are trying to make our state value estimate so this would be this branch here better so we do an evaluation step and then in the next step we are trying to make the policy better however this policy improvement will then deteriorate our value estimation so we always have to make this push-pull movement improve our policy improve our estimate which was deteriorated by that po policy improvement and so on so that can be either denoted in this yeah let's say yeah, convergence style of plot on between the trade-off of policy improvement and policy evaluation or in terms of this cycle denoted here on the left hand side and of course in generally uh, broadly speaking words we have to make a 
well-balanced trade-off between evaluating and improving the policy. So for value iteration, uh, we have let's found a nice approach to directly combine improvement and evaluation into one step. And we will see that this general idea, general mythology of GPI, general policy iteration, will be found in more or less all subsequent reinforcement learning ideas. So you are likely to see that graphic, that figure in similar form or even in the same form again and again over the next couple of lectures because this idea of um, improving and evaluating the policy and value functions sequential way is really a key concept of reinforcement learning which we today applied in a model based framework using dynamic programming and we will extend then this framework also to a sample based to data driven way starting in the next lecture. Specifically for dynamic programming, for those which may get into contact with dynamic programming may heard of the term curse of dimensionality, which is often referred in the context of dynamic programming and expresses that the computational demand of dynamic programming in comparison to other reinforcement methods is rather high. And I would like to give an evaluation on this statement of course of dimensionality on DP here. So basically first to compare it against exhaustive search, which we also discussed briefly at the beginning of the today's lectures with the shortest path problem. So exhaustive search, if we have an state space of n possible state and m possible actions, we'll need m to the power of n evaluations. So it's in an exponentially relation to each other while dynamic programming is only polynomial complex in terms of m and n. So compared to exhaustive search, we already have an, let's say, improvement in complexity. However, dynamic programming, as we said, is doing full width backup. So the entire state space is considered during the updates. So if I'm having, let's say, up to medium sized MDP, so maybe something less than a million state, that may be still feasible. But beyond that, then really the course of dimensionally begins to start because even one value update using dynamic programming could be very, very expensive because I have to take into account so many state and state transition possibilities. So in the course of dimensionality in the sense of dynamic programming is especially relevant in terms of the number of states. So if I'm having a multi-dimensional state space, then the number of states grows exponentially with the number of state variables. So as we discussed last week, in a finite MDP, I can fuse together a multi-dimensional state vector into a scalar because we can just enumerate regarding the given state combinations in that multidimensional array and therefore this fusion of uh, state multidimensional state variables into that finite state denotation would grow exponentially which of course then really leads to that course of dimensionality. Moreover, if we have to work with continuous variables in the state and action space, we need to apply quantization, which also uh, quite often leads to very large number of state and action combinations. And in these cases, in even one state update could be infeasible because we have to take into account the entire state space uh, updates using that full width up uh, backup idea of dynamic programming from that single state. And yeah, we will then discuss also in the subsequent lectures alternative methods which are not requiring a full width backup and therefore also more suitable for large MDPs. However, before we go to the next lecture, let's first summarize what you have learned today regarding dynamic programming. You have learned that DP is applicable for prediction and control in MDPs, but it requires full knowledge about the environment and is therefore considered a model-based solution, which we also call planning. We have compared dynamic programming to exhaustive search and found out that it's more efficient than exhaustive search because we don't have to try out 
uh, all possible state actions combinations independently from each other, but we can use intermediate solutions and fuse them together by the idea of overlapping sub problems of MDPs and therefore also dynamic programming. However, as discussed on the previous slide, for very large state spaces, the dynamic programming approach suffers from the course of dimensionality and is therefore more suitable for small to medium MDPs. We have also discussed that we can now iteratively improve our policy evaluation in terms of estimating and state value function and iteratively improving our policy by really policy improvement steps. And this is again a feature improvement in terms of last week where we tried to directly solve a uh, policy evaluation step and directly try to find an optimal policy by uh, a large set of Bellman dial uh, MDP equations and then try to solve everything in one big shot. And now with uh, dynamic programming ideas, we can do that in an iterative fashion and therefore also get intermediate solutions, which uh, can be, uh, for example, also applied before the final solution is really calculated. We have combined these two steps of policy evaluation and improvement by value iteration, which uh, directly uh, operates on the state value estimates by that max operator. And we have found that this idea of a generalized policy iteration where we balance them between these two procedure, procedures of policy evaluation and policy improvement is a basic concept of reinforcement learning, which we will also apply to most of our subsequent reinforcement learning solution approaches. And finally, we have seen that dynamic programming as a class of algorithms comes with many degrees of freedom. We have, for example, discussed the differences in terms of state updates. We could do full synchronous backups on the entire state space, which is, let's say, the vanilla variant of dynamic programming as we have started today. But there are also a more intelligent uh, update rules in the context of asynchronous updates. We are trying to make an intelligent ordering of state updates through the entire state space. With this summary, I'm done for today and I'm hoping that you have obtained a lot of interesting and useful insights into dynamic programming in the context of optimal decision making. I thank you for your kind attention and wish you a pleasant week.